Greetings. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hey, Jeffrey. I, I was eating. I was eating my lunch, so I had the video off. So. Uh, <laughs> how was your trip? Are you back? I am back. Yeah, yeah. It was good. It's good. I got my. I'm. Um, I'm about uh, five hundred words short of finishing my novel for the month of November. So. Wow. And the one that I was working on in Poland. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. I must say, I think it's quite interesting what I've done. So I'm quite pleased with it. So. Not an easy book to write, though, about evil, mm. about the Second World War and what the Nazis did in Poland. So, mm. yeah, rough. How's everyone feeling? Good. Excellent. I just took a cold shower. So my, head, my head is clear for a few hours. <laughs> is, it seems like an odd season to take a cold shower in. It's, it's the best. You know, I haven't had a cold in maybe five years. And um, I, I don't remember the last time I had the flu. But I started using these um, breathing techniques with cold showers inspired by Wim Hof and 100 push-ups a day. I did that for a year and then I stopped doing the push-ups because I felt like it was doing, it wasn't, after a while you can do a hundred push-ups, your body just gets used to it and it doesn't get you stronger. So I think um, every other day you can do a hundred push-ups and it has an effect. Um, but I've been um, playing around with the cold showers and I, uh, I find that it prevents you from, the cold doesn't bother me. Uh, I don't have it, you know, I, I had plenty of heat in the apartment, but I opened my windows. I like the cold. So it's kind of crazy, but uh, I recommend it. I think it has it, uh, a lot of health benefits that we probably don't even know about. But um, I think our Ice Age ancestors, they were, uh, you know, the archaic. You think about the adversities these the, our, our ancestors had to face. Um, I just want to sort of, pay tribute to them by getting under a cold shower. <laughs> well, we had a, a, a vigorous. A neighbor, we had a neighbor when I grew up. She was a German lady. She lived next door to where we lived, but she lived in a piano crate that had been converted into a house. So she was a rather eccentric old lady. And we lived about um, two kilometers from the beach. Oh. So she would walk to the beach every day, every morning, and she would have her bath in the sea. Wow. Uh, winter, summer, all year round. That's amazing. And she was in incredible health, but and also uh, Crazy a really that. interesting woman, you know, even though she had these quirky sides to herself. So I, I love that. <laughs> John, where did you uh, learn the technique exactly, the breathing exercises? Uh, from Wim, Wim Hof. I can post it. There's a lot of his stuff online. He teaches the course. I haven't done this course, but I've, um, I was introduced to it, uh, to his work through a meditation teacher who incorporates the breath work into the meditation. So I got into Wim Hof. There's a, been a, I think he's written a book and there's been a book, a couple of books written about him. I think he's an eccentric. He's a bit of a kook, but he can, he can get into, uh, you know, up to his neck in ice water for unbelievable amount of time, an hour and a half. Most people go into cardiac arrest within a minute. <laughs> and he, he's like, he's broken all records. So uh, I think it's Harvard Medical School has been doing a study on him. He also can be injected with E. coli and, not, and it won't have an effect on him, which is more important. He, his students who've only worked with him for a month they can be injected, injected with E. coli and it doesn't affect them either. So there's something to this that I think that uh, baffles Harvard Medical School. It's worth looking into because it's not, these are, these are just practices that are really cheap, no drugs, just get under a cold shower and do, I, I was doing an hour of breath work before I did my push-ups. I never thought I could get up to 50, but that I could do an hour of breath work and do 100 Thanks, uh, Shut up, 
it shows me that there's something to this, uh, the, these latent capacities. We just don't explore them. So those capacities start to atrophy. Um, so anyway, I think it's part of that uh, supermind initiative has to include, I think, the, the body and the complexity that the body is capable of. I think it should be paying as much attention to that as we are to our med- you know, meditation and, and quieting the mind and all that. Anyway, got, good to see all of you guys. Everyone's here, Matteo, Marco. Good to see you all too. Hello. Yes, the body. We can't neglect the body. It's part, a big part of the yoga. Some people say that that's it's it's the entire yoga right now. We've uh, we basically we basically done everything with the mind that we could possibly do with the mind, and that's what the mother was working on for the whole. Well, that's what they. But we're both working on post nineteen twenty six. They actually did get the super mental to descend through the mind and through the vital and then to hit the rock of the physical. And that's why Sri Aurobindo went into seclusion in, in 1926 was to, uh, to do, to work, to get the super mind into the physical. And that's what mother was working on till she passed too. It sounds, it sounds like excavation, yeah. the rock of the physical. As she said, she reported back when she, actually touched the base of the inconscient that the entire manifestation was only a scratch on the surface of the inconscient. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, inertia there, but it's also our stability. So that's the divine counterpart of the physical is uh, stability. Yeah. I, I just got back from a brisk walk outside um, I, I would like to go back to that, um, but I want to be here. I want to be outside and here, so I might try to do that later. But I was wondering if there's a frame that we might place um, based on everyone's time. And I, I understand a lot of individuals are very busy. Hmm. Did you have well, any- I think we, I'd like to start with a meditation and I think that um, we can maybe divide the time that we have available into roughly two parts. One maybe looking back, one maybe looking forward. And, uh, you know, I have various ideas, um, but I'm not feeling very directive right now. I've been fasting for the past, speaking of latent capacities, I've been fasting for the past I'm on the fourth day of a five-day fast, and I'm not quite feeling high energy right now. I, I know mm-hmm. some say that after a few days, um, you, know, you, you get over the hunger pangs and things like that. I'm not hungry, uh, but I, I don't have the energy that I do when I'm drinking coffee and eating bagels and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. So I trust it will come, um, but it, it hasn't come yet. I thought it might by, by today. And it hasn't. So uh, I'm happy to just kind of have a looser frame like that and, you know, let you all, and I'll, of course, participate, um, surface, you know, what, what has been, uh, what we've discussed so far or what we've been thinking or feeling. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then, you know, the, I think this part of the year is, is tough for coordinating things and moving, you know, forward on, on projects. But... I would like to have a sense that starting in 2019, there's some coherence around what happens next and what the different opportunities or pathways are. And, um, and that we could also get, I guess, better coordinated on like the logistics as well, which has been something that for me has been a kind of pain point. Um, uh, I think it's kind of a limiter, you know, if, if it would be easier for people to set things up and move forward on things, um, I, that would, I think that would help the whole, the whole system. So does that sound okay to you all? It sounds yeah. fine. Um, Marco, I might mix up the order of past versus future, just because I have to leave in, in about uh, an hour or so. I might mix up the things a bit, but, uh, 
overall, that sounds fine. Okay. Marco, we haven't heard your voice. Is your, is your mic working? One, two, three. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> no, I, sorry if I was five minutes too late, but I, I didn't miss the first part. So I'm still trying to catch the order of thoughts, but I'm just li listening and it's okay. Okay. Uh, shall we meditate for a little while? Maybe, uh, I don't know, three, four minutes, five minutes. Okay, let's do it. I have a bell.
I'd love to start by just like wholeheartedly thanking everyone for the capsule to pace through what we just did. I think it was a massive undertaking and, uh, and I appreciate it. I, I thoroughly, uh, yeah, I thoroughly appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you as well, um, Mateo. Um, I think you brought you know, incredible depth of um, experience and familiarity with the text and the ability to reference um, obscure you know, papers and books that uh, has, co has come out of the uh, Aurobindo community. And, um, and also doing these kinds of events, doing these kinds of, of talks, uh, it seemed, you know, what I've learned, one of the things I learned is that there's a, a whole you know, world of uh, Aurobindo students and scholars that, are, that, are, that really have been working with this material for a long time. And in my case, it was my first, I mean, I've read some bits and pieces of Aurobindo before, but not really like this. I don't know what to make of it yet. Uh, I, it ended and <laughs> uh, it's just this big chunk of experience that we all went through, but I don't know what it means yet exactly. Uh, so part of maybe what we can explore today is just what happened. And, um, and I, know that, I know that we went fast in, in the sense that one could spend a lot more time uh, with, with this text or with these texts. Uh, and there was something, uh, just given the timing of the year and given um, you know, the fact that we have multiple interests and sort of a bigger project going on than, than just reading one book here, um, it seemed important to be able to get through it. It seemed important to be able to rise to a, ch a challenge and to sustain uh, focus and um, a an intention uh, through it. And I feel like we did that. I mean, it was not always easy uh, to, to do, um, you know, given the amount of reading. Uh, but it was a very enjoyable when I was reading. And more than enjoyable, it, I think was, I don't think, I don't know if we'll be able to, um, or I'll be able to really discern the effects fully for a while. I think they're going to take some time to unfold. Um, it seems like we just planted this massive, I don't know, seed of potentiality just by even undergoing this kind of project. And um, it felt to me kind of like a culmination because we did the first, and by we, I'm speaking generally, not everybody here, not every individual, but uh, within the cosmos, infinite conversation space, it's now three years since we've been doing these kinds of uh, readings. And we've gone through Gene Gebser, we've gone through Peter Sloterdijk, we've gone through a number of novels, poetry, um, and various other conversations, more one-off, uh, um, not even one-off, but, but particular, like uh, reading papers by different authors like Jennifer Gidley or, or others. And this was, I think, the most massive <laughs> um, uh, tome that that we've read. And it also seemed, like I said, like to culminate a certain phase. Uh, I'm very interested in how this can become sustainable and how could, it could become a platform that people can use to have deep conversations, to have deep interpersonal and mutual experiences, to practice. Uh, I think that this is kind of at the conjunct the intersection of the literary the spiritual the um the intellectual i think all these facets are, are, are part of it and there's always tensions between them but when we can i think hold them in a in a common space it allows for a lot of depth at least that's what that's what i've experienced um and what i want to continue i want to really build that and build on that. Uh, I think, you know, I, I was so, when before all this, I mean, three, four, four years ago, 
I was at my wit's end because uh, it seemed like a wasteland everywhere. Uh, and there's a lot of, po- what I've discovered though, is that there are a lot of pockets of people doing really interesting things and really, you know, um, uh, maybe seeing beyond the moment, the historical moment and anticipating what wants to come, what needs to come. And that's the direction I, I feel that I want to go in. I, I want to um, continue what we're doing, do it better, sustain it, and I don't know exactly how. That's part of my inquiry this week and part of why I'm fasting. and I'm participating in an um, ayahuasca ceremony this Saturday, which um, I don't do a lot. You know, The first time was five years ago and then once in between. But this one seems to be, I mean, my, my inquiry going into this is how, you know, now that we've done this, now that we've reached this kind of milestone, really how, how to move into the next phase. And um, so I'm, I'm very interested in hearing what everyone thinks about that or feels about that because uh, it's an inquiry for me at this, at this stage. And I think some clarity will come and is coming, but it's not quite, hasn't quite arrived for me. And there have been various ideas proposed as well. The cosmopods or oropod, orocosmopods, uh, different reading groups uh, that have been uh, suggested. Uh, we continue with a writing group and we're publishing work on metapsychosis and podcasts. And there's a lot going on. Um, sometimes I feel I can get lost in the details. So, so what what kind of holds it all together and what sort of provides that coherence is, uh, is what I'm interested in. Um, I also wanted to reiterate um, not only my thanks to the group, um, but also to the many different voices uh, that come through. So, um uh marco mazzi uh here present uh i mean i love hearing the different um there are no prisms of the world that come through these conversations um maybe orobindo provides that um focus to making those prisms, uh, giving voice to those prisms, I guess. Uh, And I think that's part of uh, why I feel a little bit bereft right now, because we are no longer meeting every week. And even though I often hated, often cursed the charge of trying to wade through this reading for that <laughs> each week's effort um i miss it already <laughs> so i think aurobindo gets under your skin in ways that are a little bit like you said marco when you said you don't really know what it all means yet i, I agree that in terms of the sort of um, overall impact it's not it's still finding it's it's still settling in uh, but there are other ways that it gets under your skin that is um pernicious uh, yeah. <laughs> but um and part of that i think is the for me anyway is the poetry of his writing um and so that comes back to this issue of, uh, of what next. I think that um, a priority for me in the new year would be to pick up Savitri and do a proper reading of Savitri. I'd be happy to do it and share it with other people if other people want to join me. Um, but I'm going to propose, I'm going to set that up for the new year to do um, um, 
a, a shared reading of Savitri if people want to partake in that. Um, because of because because the poetry of of his writing, it seems to me the best place to to go for that, and uh, and it's also for me a way of keeping up the exchange around Aurobindo in a different way because I think the I mean one could also go to um, what what's the other text the the yogi synthesis of yoga. Uh, which I think uh, is it, Marco Masi? Uh, do you are you doing something on that? I think yes. So I mean, we could. There are different things we could do with it. So, um, but um, so maybe it's a is it a cosmopod that you talk about? The savagery is another cosmopod that we could do. Is that the right term? Well. We just made that up. Made that up. Uh, there is a son, <laughs> something called Oropods, which Matteo has. Oh, Oropods. Yes, sir. He's talked about that. And that Cosmopod was a way of transferring that to a non-orocentric context, uh, so that didn't have to a Cosmopod wouldn't have to be about Aurobindo's writings. Or, right. And I think the focus of those is a little bit different as well. Uh, it's not necessarily on the text or on Aurobindo. It's Matteo would better um, explain the idea. The other thing I just wanted to, before you go into that, is just say uh, I I'm not. I'm not going to go into it. I would just say the idea is super dependent on who who is involved. That's all. It's uh, the 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 system is just a system. Who is involved brings whatever they have to it. I just wanted. It's just a little thing I wanted to add that I love looking at the green trees surrounding Matteo in his, I don't know whether it's a tower or it's just a living room, but it's an amazing space to look at through the video. <laughs> I love it too. It's the Redwood Forest in California <laughs> and it's wet and it's rainy and it's green and it's beautiful right now. And I came home to a tree across the road. So there's a, there's definitely uh, challenges to living in the redwood forest, like getting home with your luggage and things like that. <laughs> Thank so you. It, Jeffrey. it was fun to see you in Munich, and he's at the Hamburg or wherever. But but it's nice to see you back in in this this green space that is so gorgeous to look at. So. It's good to be back with my dogs too. <laughs> So, yes, if I may say something, um, it's now for me the third time that I went through the life divine. And I can say that every time it's something completely new. It's every time a new discovery. Almost as if I haven't read it before. Because every time I read it, I discover new things. So it's, this was again one of the major experiences also with these sessions. Because otherwise I wouldn't have gone through it again. Uh, I, I felt a bit um, uh, pressed to reread it again so to have a better uh, uh, focus on what we were discussing here. And um, this reading is, it's almost like reading a new book again. Well, with the advantage, of course, that is the second, the third, the fourth edition is for free. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to buy the book every time. It's uh, as if it's a new book. So, and this this impression I think since you brought up Savitri, I think this in this, with Savitri, you, this is even stronger. This is even stronger because the life divine, uh, Sri Aurobindo, um, keeps himself still on the philosophical, men, mental, intellectual, higher mind uh, uh, level. In Savitri, 
he goes astray into the overmind uh, poetry. And it's, the symbols there are much more important, and the, the mantra uh, is much more important in Savitri than the intellectual content. And when you read Savitri, as is, I mean, I, I say this because the Savitri is every time is completely, completely new. And you have 700 pages. Uh, more, more than 1,000 pages for Life Divine, 700 pages for the Savitri. And then there are also lots of other uh, stuff and books that he wrote. So I I suspect that I will have it for my whole lifetime. I, it's like opening every time a new library. And so I also enjoyed very much, very much, these sessions, uh, otherwise I wouldn't have participated. Uh, I, I don't know, I arrived, I don't know when I met, but I, I, I'm here, not here from the beginning. But uh, yes, I also would enjoy to continue in one form or other, this experience, this experience in with other writings, uh, what I don't have clear in my, in my mind is uh, what um, what's the best way of sharing. Because when I read, I have some experience or understanding or feeling or call it what whatever it is. And it's difficult to share because it does not come through when I speak. <laughs> Well, this is, these are the limits. These are the limits of words, of course, and the limits of mind, of course. But I have the feeling, the sensation that there is perhaps some other possible scheme, structure, or way of organizing these sessions where this, uh, at least this um, uh, how, uh, sh sharing of of energy because it's somehow also an energy that comes down and you have the desire to share it. And there's an energy that comes down and it's blocked here and not very much comes through when I, I'm, I'm participating. In it. But it's not, it's not critics, it's just, I'm, I'm just trying to understand if eventually there is some different structure and way to organize sessions uh, at, le at least for the readings of Sri Aurobindo, I mean, because here, uh, as you said, um, Geoffrey, it's it's here you, you have the prism. In fact, I, I agree with you that the writings of Sri Aurobindo act like prism, and everyone emanates one color, but to get the whole a uh, view of his writings, of his teachings, of his philosophy, or call it whatever, how, however you want, uh, you have to catch all the rays of the prism that the prisms uh, projects. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to, to I'm, I, I have nothing conclusive so far. I'm, I'm a little confused on that. I have to think on that more. But yes, in any case, I would like very much to continue, continue these sessions. Eventually, with you, Jeffrey, I would like to maybe uh, um, share also some thoughts about science. Um, because I think uh, Sri in, in many in many respects, is very, very um, actual. It depends, however, of course, from rep what perspective one, one, one uh, uh, sees and receives his writings and how one puts it in relation to modern science as it is intended nowadays. Um, yeah, and then, then I didn't. I wanted to say something about fasting because I exercise this a bit, but I forgot somehow. It was about this this fact of the energy. Yes, it was the energy that comes down when you have 
my experience was that there came no energy at all. Uh, but I didn't go through this um, crisis. All people talk about the crisis of, uh, there's a one moment, I don't know how you say it in English, but um, where the hunger is, you have this uh, contractions in the stomach because of the hunger. Uh, I didn't go through this, but I didn't even, but I felt very well. And I, what I discovered, and this was a quite good yogic experience, so to speak, because there I discovered how much our mind is dependent, or, or, or the contrary, how much uh, the stimulus of hunger is dependent from our mind. And, not, and much less than we think from our body. If we can det detach from the mind, 80% of the hunger goes away. <laughs> this was a very interesting experience. But just this is a short bracket. It, it, it is not necessarily relevant to the topic of the session. So I close it here. I, I would like to say that it's absolutely relevant. Um, I noticed a lot of noddings from a lot of people when you were going into how do we share that energy. Uh, prism, we've noticed. We, um, how do we bring maybe the outside gaze to the prism to see all the voices, to see where we're going, to see what needs to be said. Um, that's definitely a project I'm personally focusing on right now to how, how do we best share this energy? And it, it can be, if we're focused on the talks here, we demonstrated that as it naturally formed into the European session and the um, North American section session. We, we needed to be able to be awake at a certain time, um, the logistics. So there's that aspect of the discussions. But during the calls, how do we best explore that? Uh, Johnny and I did a one-on-one -on -one session yesterday exploring similar ideas, if not the same idea. And I, I confess that to get this energy out, during my commute to and from work, I'm, I'm singing. It's a, like an opera rap, but this is a, a voice I've never had before. And it's not necessarily opera or rap, um, but it, it can, the voice, it's my attempt to get that energy, wherever it might be, out into the, the public sphere. So if I was to project that right now, I would just start singing. Um, words would come out and it would be what I need to say in that moment. I've been recording these and I, I'm afraid to a certain extent to share them. Um, especially since right now it's just accumulation of personal thoughts. But if it was towards a reading like our Obindo, um, it would come out um, in our world. But when I actually come to the meeting, I, I tend to not have the preparation of exactly how I'd like it. So to have that energy expressed, shared in that, that moment with the momentum of what, what we've been expressing, I've been searching for that as well. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we could have just a single Zoom video and say, just easily have that available on the site and click on it real quick and this is what I need to say about this topic. And people can watch that before maybe a one-on-one -on -one session or an ROPOD, whatever it might be. Um, 
but the, the divide is the technological divide um, for expressing in a lot of ways. But there's also, even if we're physically together, there will still be uh, the holdups, I believe. But yeah, we're, um, I know Marco is working on the site and I'm getting glimpses of to some ideas and the whole idea right now is to provide that online technological platform so that divide is easily um, divided into what we, we see as our individual prism voices so we can all come together in some coherence, I suppose. So there's, there's quite a few ideas being explored and we're, we're doing it right now. Thank you, Doug. Thank all of you um, for your insights and sharing. I'm just trying to uh, mention uh, Doug, and I did have a lovely talk yesterday, and he helped me to um, articulate some of the things that I learned uh, over the course of this last year, and uh, and the, in particular the Aurobindo reading. And but and Doug mentions the voice, and the, uh, bringing forward that voice in a public sphere. We talked about opera and rap. And uh, Marco Massey mentioned um, sharing and the limits that, uh, and uh, about the energy coming down and perhaps getting stuck in a place and being aware of that and, and how that uh, shapes our communications. And um, the prism was mentioned also as a metaphor. Um, and uh, the savitri as a possibility and, and focusing attention on the, um, the poetic qualities of Aurobindo. And, um, and Marco Morelli mentions holding the tensions in a common space and building from that. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what I want to add, except that I, um, I believe that uh, what I learned, I think, um, as I reflect upon this adventure with Aurobindo, is that there are different kinds of transcendence, there are different kinds of imminence, and there are different kinds of reading. And to, to also, I believe that there's a challenge in, I think we have a crisis of the frame. Um, I believe we are having trouble framing things because so much is coming at us. Um, that and how to make sense of um, all the all of these differences. I think there is a there is. I think a romanticizing of chaos. Um, that I. I have um, very mixed feelings about um, because I, chaos is, I think, not something you should get romantic about. Um, and I think that um, reading Aurobindo has been uh, helpful for me, learning how this, uh, this person with a great deal of controversy in his own life um, managed to pull together uh, from different traditions, East and West, something that was coherent. And so coherence is um, an order out of chaos. Um, is very attractive to me. Um, and in my own life, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I read in a very uh, visceral kind of way, and um, and it depends on what I'm reading. I mean, different kinds of texts demand a certain kind of attention. Uh, so I think it would be a, a, an interesting process to go from reading this text, uh, the divine life divine, and reading Savitri, because I think there's a different kind of registers that Aurobindo was writing in, according to Banerjee. I haven't read his book, but he 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 mentions that 
the uh, Aurobindo's philosophy is is varied, and he's it's scattered over many different books. So you, you can't get it all in one book. Um, and each book is is he's writing for a slightly different audience. So I think that's very instructive. Um, and also, I think there's uh, the biggest dilemma that I've carried with me since I was about five years old. And I didn't have language for it then. And I still don't have language for it. But there's um, imagination and reality. Um, and the subtle and the physical. And and, and the interplay between, and you know, philosophers, poets, artists, uh, business people, everyone has to deal with these um, the subtle and the physical. And uh, the meditators and, and yogis found certain kinds of techniques that they used and brought forward different kinds of philosophy. So I think this is, a, I did a picture, I shared this yesterday. Um, this is sort of idiosyncratic to me. <clears throat> I, I, I draw pictures and then I dance around the room sometimes. And sometimes I listen to a piece of music. Uh, so that's how I, I integrate um, the things that all the mini models that I'm reading and studying and different books I'm reading. I try to put them together in something that makes sense to me. It may not make sense to anyone else, but if it makes sense to me, then I think I can communicate something. Um, so I did this little drawing. Actually, it's not that little, but this is my uh, working with the body. And what is the body? I think this is a big question that Aurobindo and the mother had. And working with the levels. This is the beyond. This is the, the, the body, the physical and the subtle. And there are more than one physical body. There are many bodies that are physical. And it's the, the up, down, the hierarchical arrangements, but also the interplay between multiple bodies in the subtle and in the physical. And there's the, this black stuff uh, is like noise. I think, I think Orbinda would call it the inconstant, but I call it noise because I'm trying to update the vocabulary that, um, that doesn't seem to work for me as much as, and I don't think the hierarchy coming from above and going down and excavating the physical, I, I understand where that's coming from and I think it's valid. And I also think for me, it's necessary to add something to that. And I think that being able to differentiate noise from signal and the ratio between noise and signal is really what we're dealing with in our contemporary world with the internet and the technology that's advanced so quickly and most of us can't keep up with. And I believe that's part of the, the crisis that we're in. Is we, we, we can't, dip, it's hard for us to tell the signal from the noise. And also you can't have a signal without noise. And sometimes the noise is the signal, <laughs> but there has to be someone in some sort of center that can differentiate signal and noise and the ratios, and then communicate from that. Um, or we're just gonna descend into utter chaos. I think there's a great survival value in enough of us who are paying attention to the quality of our attention. I think this is what Aurobindo and Mother were, at, were doing in their ashram. I think they had a very uh, safe container for exploring some of this very volatile energy that was moving through their systems and their social system as well. So I think we're trying to uh, do something very similar. And also I think we've been doing something different because we're now, and I think this comes out of a conversation that I had with, with Doug and with Marco, not only is there's a subtle body and the physical body, but there's the virtual body, which is the body that we're communicating through right now. And is what is the what are the what is the relationship between the physical, the subtle, and the virtual, especially 
if the virtual is being run by algorithms which are designed by people with a very narrow focus. Basically, they want to make money off of you, off of us. And with that narrow focus, I believe that this gift to humanity can come, become an incredible curse. And I believe that um, Banerjee is very articulate about this, how the, the shadow of the technology needs to be confronted because it isn't alive, but it has enormous impacts. Um, so anyway, those are the things that I'm taking away from this particular reading. And, um, and I look forward to uh, you know, finding ways, the ways and the means, and maybe new methods for bringing forward uh, when we read it our best. Um, and study at our best and communicate at our best. And um, developing new metaphors. And I think that's what I, I enjoyed so much about reading Orbindo is his use of metaphor. He's quite a master of metaphor. That uh, I think the one that I found he used most often was the veil. How the veil is lifted, the veil comes back down. The veil is lifted, the veil comes back down. There's signal and then there's noise. Then there's signal and noise and the interplay between the ratios. I think that um, new metaphysics are going to emerge. New subjectivities are emerging, even as we speak. And I hope we can, as one philosopher I read recently, I can't remember his name, he said it's not about the survival of the fittest. It is about the arrival of the fittest. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can create the conditions for a future people who are more fit than we are now. So thank you for this, this golden opportunity. <laughs> and blessings upon us all for, this, this, for making this happen. That was lovely, Johnny. I took notes. <laughs> I love the things you said, different kinds of transcendence, different kinds of eminence, different kinds of reading. I, I want to think about that. There is imagination and reality, the subtle and the physical and the virtual, and their interplay. Love that too. And I also love I draw pictures and then dance around the room to integrate things. I think that's a good example of subversive pedagogy, which is what we're going to be talking about next week. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that next week. That's going to be fun. Um, just to come back on a couple of things that um, Marco Mazzi mentioned. So I would love to have a conversation about physics and Aurobindo. I don't know how or exactly under what format. Um, uh, and I know it's an area that, that uh, Debeshesh is interested in. So maybe we could, I don't know whether he'd be interested, but, but one might see if we could get uh, some interest on his part for that. Um, so that would be something I'd like to follow up with you on. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was about Savitri uh, and what you were saying about different kinds of ways of doing this. So uh, I was thinking as you were talking that um, maybe we could read Savitri aloud. Uh, and I don't know whether we could read the whole thing because when Matteo said 700 pages, I thought, oh, <laughs> I, I knew it was big, but I didn't quite realize it was that big but <laughs> let's just say 36 hours rather than 700 pages <laughs> it's about 36 maybe not even that maybe about 30 30 to 36 hours so do the math so, it's not that i loop through it all the time with different groups and right, it's all so. it's always read aloud yeah. okay so because the loud i think the 
reading aloud gives a very different sense to what we're so the energy is there right when you read aloud whereas when we're just talking it's not that there isn't an energy there but i think the energy is different and, and interesting and it has so i mean we were talking about this metaphor of the prism that i used but we can also use the metaphor of uh, i don't know it, it, it's slightly physics arcane language but the idea of a black body so a a black body is a body that perfectly absorbs things and in a sense and and then because it perfectly absorbs things it perfectly re-emits in a particular um frequency spectrum which is characteristic of black bodies and so in a way orobindo does that for us it allows us to perfectly absorb each other's energies and then re-emit them in these interesting ways so that's maybe another way to think about it um and i think the re the reading aloud favors that in ways that the shared sharings you know don't do in quite the same way so um so that's a suggestion may i ask mateo how, how did these um cycles that you've done with savitri worked logistically like how do you go through the whole text with a group of people and perhaps in an online format, how, how has that actually worked for you? So your question is, how has it worked? Right. I mean, what happens in a session? Does one person read the whole oh. or is are there kind of... I immediately go to experience. What happens? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah just practical. The, the simple practical thing uh, is it depends on how many people <clears throat> um, and you would just create, a, if it were this circle, I'm looking at my screen and I'm seeing a circle, Jeffrey, Mateo, John, Marco, Douglas, Marco, and you just read in a circle. And, and uh, it's really nicest to read a complete canto. And that can always be judged at a rate or, or predicted at a rate of approximately 25 pages an hour. Uh, so I'm, I've gotten really good at facilitating because I just kind of can feel how slow and it's really best read slowly and not being in a rush. And, and uh, yeah, I've got groups that meet and I've got a group here in Santa Cruz. We meet twice a month. We've been cycling through it. I don't know. We've had six laps through it since 2012. Um, the Berlin and the, the Lodi immersion that goes every year, we lap through it, uh, have a single reading through it in um, three to five days, right? It's a, you can say it's just 30 hours, right? So it's, it really depends on uh, how often you meet. And it's really, it's really nice to be in a meditative space and uh, be pronouncing we, I mean, that, that's a whole different conversation, like how to read Savitri. And I appreciate that there's a million ways to read Savitri. But the punctuation is really important. And knowing that it's not iambic pentameter, but that it's quantitative meter in three to five quantitative feet per line. And you just kind of follow the, the punctuation to get at that. That makes it really uh, beautiful and, and easy. But so I, I work in twos and... I've got uh, people that I've just been reading with one-on-one uh, -on -one, and we do a lot of different things with one friend. There's these uh, lovely books that I don't know if uh, they're not even open yet. The Shradavan, you all have heard her name at least. The English of Savitri. She just dives in because she's doing it for people who are English as a second language, but it's super useful for me. These, uh, there's, there's a gazillion books that have been written on Savitri. Um, yeah, yeah, I would be like, I, I would be pretty honored to read it with this group. I think it would be, uh, I think it would be lovely, but I'm not, I don't want to suggest any, I don't want to suggest this group to go in any particular direction. I know that there's people that are not present that want certain things too. So I don't want to, I don't have an agenda with, with this group. I'm happy to kind of go with the flow and, 
I, I do want to say that this lovely conversation about how to articulate experience and how to come together in a, a more meaningful way. I love this conversation. And uh, I pose the question all the time with people who have been practicing integral yoga for decades. How, how do we practice integral yoga? What is the practice? And, and um, that kind of, uh, I find that when things get really mental, there's a lot of males present. And that's not a, a that's not like, I don't know if you all, I, I don't like to go to generalizations, but I, I feel like we, in, in integral yoga groups, there is such a balance between, uh, it, there's such a sex balance. Almost all the groups that I work with with integral yoga are, are uh, sex balanced, uh, equal number of men and women. And the, I think that the reason, uh, I don't know the reason, uh, well, I, I mean, I know the reason in integral yoga, but I just, I always... I always kind of see this tendency when we go rational, philosophical, that uh, that fewer women show up for that. I, I don't, I'd love to hear other people's opinions about that. Uh, but but sacred circle work, I don't, Jeffrey and John, I, I'm sorry about the division that happened because I was in Europe because I missed you too. Like I missed your voices. And also I met one-on-one -on -one with Marco and Doug and Marco, and I meant to meet one-on-one -on -one with both John and Jeffrey, and I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one talk. This going into dyads, something happens that can't come through when there's 12 people on the screen and, and, uh, and working in sacred circles. So this, I was, I was, we were trying it in the other meeting um, and, and there's, there's ways to get, I feel like just with that working with the sacred circle, there's, it's like dead online, it's designating an order of the circle and, uh, and having this, this thing that we tried in the beginning of our meeting was pregnant pauses between like I finish, I finish talking, I mute, and then we take five breaths and whoever comes after me then can come in slowly and sense into their own center and sense into the group center. And I found that in working with groups of even two to two to four, kind of with a maximum of four, the sacred circle work once the circle, if it's able to go around a couple of times, if our vital bodies don't take over and are screaming to be heard for whatever reason, if the circle can go around two, three, four times, something emerges that can't be predicted, can't be forced. It's just something emerges. If we go around one, right now we've basically had one loop through the circle more more or less we've basically had everyone's at least come off of mute once and it hasn't really been a sacred circle set up in the sense of uh, meditative pregnant pauses between an established order to go around and the established order doesn't work for some people because uh well we could get into that deeper but um but but yeah there's there's something that emerges when a sacred circle is established that uh, that may be more useful for our conversational meetings. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just some. I'm just kind of uh, riffing right now. Mm, Matteo, just a question: uh, When you made this uh, Savitri, Savitri readings, these were always or only readings there was not the conversational part the it's, question. Why, it's why i brought up the shradavan book i have a friend who we've been reading savitri together now for almost a decade and we love to do braided reading uh savitri if you've looked at the contos they're divided into sections these sections are like complete Vedic suktas. So you can pick up Savitri and just read one section, not even a kanto. You can read one section and it feels very complete. And a section is where there's a section break, a space on the page. And so we like to um, like he'll read one section 
then I'll read a section, then I'll read the next section, then he'll read the next section. We'll kind of walk through it. And he and I will even do a braided reading where he'll read one sentence, which could be anywhere from one line to 10 lines, one complete sentence with a period at the end. And then I'll read that exact sentence, then I'll read the next sentence then he'll read that sentence. We'll go back and forth like that. Some real depth comes about some real, the, the, there's the, there's some things that experientially when we take pause that, uh, that like touch something much deeper. So there was, there were no, no direct conversation and exchange of thoughts, feelings, just reading. No, no, no. He with him we uh we linger, we we talk. Yeah. Yeah, but most of the time when it's a group if we uh if we uh, the the I don't know how to put this. The 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 container doesn't stay protected from ego and the vital if uh if we uh, if if it's a conversation and discussion. And because everyone's got their own process going yeah. on. If someone stops in the middle of a of a, of a, a Vedic thought and <laughs> talking about their experience, it can really damage other people. Like some, there is some chaos that sets in for people that there's potential for hurting uh, people. And, and yeah, and in a real way, I'm not being flippant about that. There's yeah, I, I I've got I we all have experiences on those lines. I think of of uh, having someone interrupt our experience and process by imposing their experience and process into it. So that there, there, that kind of has to be protect. I, I only do conversation if it's one-on-one -on -one, to just be like really straight and blunt. Uh, okay. And that's what, that's what people that I've been working with for a long time. And we have a, we have a trust established where we can do that. Okay, now, now, now I see this uh, structure with which you are working a little bit better. Yes, I, I completely agree. Uh, Savitri is not something to discuss about uh, because, or at least, or one has one sort of uh, approach or the other. It is dangerous to mix uh, 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 reading with uh, conversational exchange of experiences. Um, especially in Savitri, I agree this is, can be a big danger that then the ego comes in and, and, and one needs to rush in and the vital uh, goes, uh, bubbles up, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, yes. Um, but Nevertheless, I was trying to find out a form because with the life divine, we took a, the opposite approach and it was also very enriching. Yeah. So the, my, my ideal, which is perhaps too ideal, I don't know, would be to find a way how to organize something where both com complement each other's, both approaches can complement each other's, but not for Savitri, I thought eventually for the synthesis of yoga or other readings of Sri Aurobindo, uh, because perhaps the conversational approach works better for the more intellectual uh, 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 writings of, of, of Sri Aurobindo, like the life divine. Um, but also another point which uh, mm, hinted at uh, John, who wrote about a gift to humanity. I, I love this very much, this, <laughs> this idea that, or, or f something for the future of the people. Both of these readings are still something which are for us, which is great. But there is, at least for me, maybe I have this missionary impulse, I don't know. But I would like also to have something that is done for others. For uh, where we read something and 
in a video recording nowadays with modern technologies, it's not a problem. No? Through a recording, people who are also do not participate get something out of it and can relate to what we are doing and can follow it also. So, so the reading is important because if there's a reading, one can also hear what a canto, a chapter of this or that uh, 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 work is about, can follow and can follow also the discussions, the sharing that we, ha we have. So what I'm somehow missing is also something that we can structure in such a way that can be put out there that also others can profit from. Maybe not now, maybe in three years, five years, or we, <laughs> maybe, maybe we will no, no longer be here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, but uh, mm, something that can also function as a seed for someone who does not follow directly these sessions. This is something I, that, that I would like very much. So to put together the reading, so there is, well, bluntly speaking, just the mental content, if you wish, and also complemented by the experiential and the intuitive and the energy that everyone brings to this content. And I think modern technology gives us this possibility, but I don't know how exactly, but in any case. Um, yeah, ah, as to the science and the physics, yes, I would greatly appreciate to discuss with you, Jeffrey, with, with this thing. I'm actually um, trying to put together a sort of paper, still not a publication. Mm, it's still a sort of draft, more or less confusingly, where I have ideas which, which come up here and there. And I'm putting together uh, Sri Aurobindo in the context of modern physics. And uh, when I have something, maybe I can, I can send you them <laughs> and then we can agree every, eventually, uh, if you wish, to discuss about it. And, and see, obviously, these are parallels uh, that I'm making. It's, um, it's not a scientific paper. It's a metaphysical, philosophical paper that relates, obviously, to modern physics. So eventually, we can begin with that. Uh, also, it's also for others, of course, uh, too. Yes. Um, Okay. Ah, by the way, there is, if if you are impatient about, a, maybe you already know him, there is a, a disciple, of, a, a, well, a, a disciple of Sri Aurobindo, someone who lives in the ashram in, in Pondicherry, who is a physicist and who has already written, already written about uh, a lot of things between quantum mechanics and what he calls the interpretation of Pondicherry. Not of Copenhagen, but of Pondicherry. <laughs> and his, his name is Ulrich Mo Mohoff. Ulrich Mohoff. Yeah, yeah, I have, yeah, I have you, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, my approach is a bit, bit different, I think. But uh, maybe we can begin, begin also from, from his approach. Yes, um, so... I have a lot of ideas. It's a bit scattered here and there. It's not in a precise order. I just, it's out of just at random, like, 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 like I'm just saying things like they are coming up. So, yes, so far so good. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I'm sorry. I would normally leave five breaths, but I have to run. So I'm going to jump in and just say my last few things before I, I leave you all. Um, so I love the five breaths, um, Matteo. It's uh, Doug and I share some commonalities around Quaker practice and 
Quaker meetings also have that space between two people speaking. And so it's, it's sort of part of the way I tend to think about group activities. So, um, so yes, Matteo, I was going to suggest maybe a paper. So the fact that you're already working on one, because it helps structure the exchange if we have a kind of a goal to work on together. Um, so I, I like that. Um, Matteo, I'm thrilled that you'd like to have a one-on-one. -on -one. I know you're a very busy guy, and I've been thinking about how much I'd like to spend a little bit more time with you talking with you. So I'm really excited that you, that it's mutual, that it's not just. <laughs> so, um, and for Savitri, maybe a, a suggestion. So I've, it's thinking, so I understand the issues that, uh, that sharing the conversational aspect with the reading aspect, maybe a slight uh, incompatibility in a certain kind of way. But possibly one way to deal with that would be to that uh, participants can comment on the savitry reading through another reading. That is to say, they can read excerpts from somebody else's writings in relation to what is being, you know, like for instance, other poetry or other, you know, like we we've had discussions about the relation between savitry and Paradise Lost, for instance. But there are also relationships. I think with uh, T.S. Eliot, who who also has a very spiritual. So, and there may be other writers as well. So, possibly one could intricate the reading of Savitri with the readings from other writers as a way of allowing comment, but not allowing open-ended comment that can go into disruptive modes. Anyway, it's something we could maybe think about and, and uh, see whether or not it's workable. Uh, I don't know if you've had any experience with that before, Matteo, but. I'm super open. I, I just, uh, yeah, I'm super open. I love talking about Savitri. It's just uh, the, the mantra is so powerful that uh, I feel like it needs its own space without discussion. And then I was thinking, we, I mean, we could loop through Savitri in a year, uh, doing it twice a month, and the other two uh, sessions a month, we could be alternating, like reading yeah. and discussion, reading One, and discussion. Yeah. I like that. That's another way of doing it. Anyway. Yeah. So, well, that, so that the following discussion, can we can actually go deeper and, and start doing cross-referencing. Yeah, there, I hear T.S. Eliot in a number of lines, and then, of course, I hear Milton. The, a lot of the languages uh, is, you know, Sri Aurobindo was steeped in Milton. Sri Aurobindo was very aware of T.S. Eliot. When yeah, there's there's even some lines that I hear like eyes I dare not meet in dreams here in death's kingdom these do not appear. I mean there there's like I hear traces like this in Savitri. It's beautiful to see. But where where T. S. Eliot was like uh, I don't know T. S. Eliot's dark. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, Bendo. There's a lot of light there. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm totally open. Although Milton's quite dark, too, or can be quite dark uh, as well. I've only had one pass through Paradise Lost, but yeah, yeah, there's some darkness there, too. So anyway, we'll maybe work something out in the new year about how can... I'm certainly open to playing with the way we do it, but uh, aware of the context around uh, not mixing things up too much with the actual readings, so... And with that, I'll leave you. I have another meeting, so. Bye, Jeffrey. Bye-bye. See you soon. I uh, really appreciate all the, this flow of ideas and suggestions and possibilities. And this is just another possibility. I think this has been sort of mentioned, but... Um, Banerjee's book, I think some of us have this and referred to it. I've not read, I've just read the uh, first couple of the introductory, maybe the first chapter. Um, but he he's looking at 
Deleuze and people like that, and Simon Don. And so he's um, got it. It seems like he has a, a foot in both camps. Um, and I, I, I was wondering if maybe we could do with energy what we did with Erin Manning. She was another philosopher that we studied, and we had an, she, she came to our first session and sort of did a, an intro about, you know, her history and how she came to writing this book, and we all got a chance to ask her questions. And then we did a study group. And I think we had five, maybe six sessions. We completed her book. And um, I think maybe that would be something that um, Banerjee would sponsor us in reading his book. <laughs> you know? So I think there would be a reward for him. And it wouldn't just be him being altruistic. But I, I would think that that would be uh, something that we could offer him, that we're we're going to be studying his work. And if he could come and give us an introductory talk and maybe we could pose questions to him at that time. Uh, what I find really exciting about the groups that we've had, which is very different from Coursera and MIT and all the, the, the courses that are offered online, is that this is, this is peer to peer. And we're not, I know peer to peer has sort of gotten sour. People, had so utopian hopes that have been crushed in many ways. But I think this idea is still alive and should be honored because we're just we're just citizens and we're we're, we're dedicated to all kinds of things and uh, to come from different walks of life and we're just coming together and bringing forward our best and seeing what happens because uh, we're not there's no professor here with advanced degrees, there's no pop quiz at the end of this. And so I, I really believe this is a, a, a very healthy trend um, rather than, you know, all the certification programs and the diplomas and the things that are going to get you ahead. You know, I, I think those are good too, but I think this is not what we're doing. And I like the idea of, uh, of doing a, the Savitri reading sounds great and the approach I really like. And I, I think that, um, Matea's the prosody, the distinctions you're making between iambic pentameter and um, how Orbindo was using English. I'm a real nerd, so that kind of stuff really interests me. <laughs> so I and I also um, read a few chapters from Future Poetry, Orbindo's book on poetry, where he talked about Mallarmé and T. S. Eliot and Milton and Shakespeare and Keats. I mean, he had the he was very really grounded in the English poets and French poets too. So uh, I find that might be a real compliment to reading Savitri is um, maybe those who are interested could as background to the Savitri performance. I love the idea of a performance sort of sounds to me like a, doing a, like a chamber music where we just get together and let the voice do, do the work for us. And there's a discursive element too. There's poetry. There's po performance, and then there's po poetics, which is much more philosophical. And um, I think we can do it all at the same time. Uh, you know, if we can differ differentiate those differences and, and the integrate them, I believe Aurobindo would be proud of us. Because um, I think that's what he was doing. And uh, I think there are different ways of doing it depending on, you know, the intensity level uh, and the uh, commitment and um, the, the leisure that we might have. But I also had this question. Uh, I think you posed this, uh, Matteo, about the, the gender, um, the presence of genders and how, how that influences a reading. And I'm, I have mixed feelings about this. I also have mixed feelings about what, what people call disruptive. Um, there's disruptive, and then there's there's different kinds of disruptive. And I, I have a belief, this is a belief, a, a value I hold, that you know the shadow and the ego will never transform in disruption-free environments. <clears throat> if you want to eliminate all disruption, you will also eliminate any chance of transformation. So I'm all for, but I also, I want, I'm, I'm moving towards coherence rather than decoherence. 
there is a kind of disruption which I believe we need to protect ourselves from and be very vigilant about. But I think that uh, I think there there's a healthy expression of ego, and there's unhealthy expressions of ego, and we need to sort of be sensitive to the subtle differences. So if someone gets seriously off track, we don't shame them, but we sort of okay, this is my feeling. I'm checking in with my my center here, and this may be something that may be useful or helpful for the group. And I, I'm very aware that um, I, I sometimes go into areas that I find risky because I may be disruptive, but I feel like something needs to be said. And I'm not always sure whether it's my ego or, or not, or is there a shadow that is demanding our attention? And if we don't give that shadow our human presence, it will continue to be a haunted ghost and be, as di- and be even more disruptive. So I think that's the challenge for us. Um, I, I mean, I certainly don't have an answer to that, but I do think there's, we can go mental, we can go meta, we can go meta, 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 meta. And I think those maps are absolutely crucial. And I love map making. You know, I think that's a grand thing to, to study is different maps. And I also believe that these, all of these maps must be supporting just the way you hold a little baby. As you rock a little baby to sleep, you've got to be the heart and the gut need to be included and protected and held by all these, this map making. Because if we're just going map making forever without integrating the maps, I think we're just going to uh, be creating a divorce. And I think that's what we find disruptive in, in, the, in the male, in male energy, or hyper-masculine energy, which is so invested in dominance and, uh, and pr- privileging the mental. And I think our education tends to do this to us. And I believe a lot of us are trying to, to reprogram ourselves. And, um, and, our, and, our, and, our, and, and often and women can be suffering from this as well as men without a doubt. <clears throat> so I don't want to turn it into uh, making the genders, uh, trying to fix the genders in a kind of grid, because I, I think we're all very fluid. And so I think the spectrum of consciousness, the, the head, heart, gut, and the flows, um, I think this is what he's, he's tracking. And, um, and he has a, his own particular stance or bent on. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to what happens next. And I, I'm sure we'll, we'll, some sort of, the group will organize. Um, but I do think that the, the, the way I try to monitor myself is if I'm going to go to, from a first person account about something, I want to be sure that I'm mindful of the group. And is, this, is the group going to benefit from this? Or is this just some masturbation fantasy of mine that I'm going to share? Um, I, I would not think that a very healthy trend if that started to happen. But I do think first-person accounts of my first-person experience may be very idiosyncratic and weird, but I think that needs to be a part of the mix, as well as those third-person objectivizing tendencies. And those, the objective can be healthy as well, as well as unhealthy. So I think we have to sort of figure that out the best way we can as we go along. But just being mindful of these, of these holding these tensions is, I believe, are going to support our work together. So thank you. This has been really good. Um, I indicated on the post that we'd go for 90 minutes. I can go a few minutes more if others want to, but we're at the, the end point. Uh, and it sounds like everything I've heard has been, as far as the possibilities, has been really wonderful. Um, I feel more energy now than I did before. (laughs) And, um, um, just a couple things. The idea of performing and of creating an artifact that others can 
access and benefit from, I think would be a wonderful way to close that circle, to kind of create a, a sacred circle between the inner and the outer, or between the private and the public. I really benefited a lot from Shradavan's reading of The Life Divine. I wish she had done part two, or <laughs> book two, uh, because it cut off after the, after the first book, and I, I was... I was listening to those recordings and um, and I did a lot of re- out reading aloud when I was reading the text. Maybe 60 or 70 percent of it I read aloud because I wanted to embody the embody the, uh, the language and the ideas and the, the spirit of what I think is being transmitted through the, through the book. So to do that would be really wonderful and I think then to present it on a on a page well organized that uh, uh, others can find and engage with would be a, a great thing. That's part of what I want to do. That's part of why I wanted to do this whole platform is because I I, I don't want to keep all this stuff to my you know, to myself or to a small group. I want it to be. Um, I want people to find it, and I want people who need it to find it. Uh, I've heard from folks over the past few years, even though they don't participate, even even if they're kind of lurkers, um, but they, they express a lot of appreciation. And, um, you know, many times they don't, because of where they live geographically, they don't have a community that is um, concerned with or uh, practicing uh, these kinds of things. So it's kind of a lifeline for, for folks. And, I, I think that that's a great service to, to provide. And it's, it's also why I wanted to do this in a different model. The peer-to-peer, I think, is a way to get, it's an alternative, you know, to the, um, the corporate, um, you know, top-down, extractive kind of, kind of mode that really just wants, wants to, it may have a lot of other benefits. There are tons of benefits to Google and Facebook and all these, and Apple, et cetera, but but at the heart of it is this extractive impulse uh, to, to really use our attention for, um, you know, just for making a lot of money. And I think I mean, money is important uh, in the sense that in, to live in this world, we need to have uh, you know, th- those flows uh, happening. But I really could see those happening in much better, much healthier ways so that they're not central, they're not dominant. I, th- I think that I think that the, the vision of the future, the, the world, the being that we w- wish to bring forth really should be central. Uh, and I think that was the really inspiring thing to me about Aurobindo is that he seems so clear, so confident, and not just in an idealistic or a romantic way, but in, in a very concrete way in the sense that this is, these are the kinds of capacities and these are ki- the kinds of potentialities that can be realized in a human body. Or in a transhuman body, whatever, whatever, whatever we're we're moving towards, that's the what I want to orient toward. I want to bring my attention to bring that world forth, and I think we do it in these little pockets, and then the pockets grow a little bit, and they interconnect with other pockets, and you know, suddenly you have you have a whole a different society. That's what I think we need. Uh, so I see Aurobindo as a tremendous visionary. Uh, in that sense, and of course, not the only one. Um, I, I like that we can bridge between different visionaries and kind of create a, a meta vision that gets actualized. So uh, I'm glad that we're doing that here, and I'm so appreciative for for all of you and um, for this occasion that we've that has come that that has uh, manifested uh, for and through us. Um, so, I, I, like I said, I, I do. I do have to go soon, um, but I'll I'll stick around for any anybody else's comments. And um, D- Doug has hinted, indicated. I, I have been working on on technology and things like that, and trying to get that in order so that it, it becomes easier for things to happen without either me or Doug having to s- schedule something and then download the audio or video and then upload it. Uh, I'd like to make that all a lot easier so that it becomes as seamless as possible for someone to set up a conversation with somebody or with a group um, 
you know, enact it and then, and then put it out uh, to, however they wish to. I mean, with whatever level of privacy that they, they wish to. Uh, I'm myself moving toward outwards. I want to bring the inner out. I want to bring the energy down and through. So I'm, I'm not so interested in private things. Um, I'm, that is not to say I, I am, I like the smaller groups. I like the dyads and the, the pods and things like that. But I, I have no need or reason to hide any anything. Like I want the process to be transparent in a sense because our own foibles, the, the ways that we mess up, the ways that we're not imperfect, I think is part of what is actually a benefit to other people to see that, that uh, the, the, the ways that we're, we, um, you know, are finding our way, I think it can be really instructive. And, and I think that others will learn from our mistakes. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm, I don't want to um, hide that. Uh, so, oh, I don't know what else to say. I, I will be back next week. Oh, the, um, the thing about disruption so Jeffrey's paper that we're that, that we're, we'll be uh, exploring in the next cafe Tuesday at noon Mountain is called Subversive Pedagogy, the Intruder. Uh, so he has a sort of archetype or or idea of maybe what a positive disruption would look like in educational terms. Um, so you're all invited, of course, to to join us for that. And that's all I'll say for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I have to go soon too, but if anyone has closing statements, that would be great to listen to. I feel so very satisfied. Thank you. Just uh, a real brief statement of yeah. thank you and uh, really embodying, that, that's one of my goals is to embody each of your personalities. The, the more intimate I am with the group, um, those that I care about most, that I see the most, um, I want to embody them. So I've, I'm taking little bits here and there from all of you, along with uh, the, the spaceships that come in, such as the alien life form that is Arobindo, and presenting us with these otherworldly ideas. And we're, we're left with uh, the writings, the seeds from whatever it might be. And so we're, we're the... Uh, the Johnny Apple seeds, I guess. So, yeah, just a quick thanks for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, as as a concluding remark, I just wanted to say I, I like very much your your image, uh, Marco, uh, about the energy. To this this desire to bring out the energy yeah? that's something that I feel also strongly yeah? <laughs> of course at the, at the same time one must be mm, there are some preca precautions that s someone has to take in, in this regards and I'm also not the guy who likes to keep everything private but at the same time I think it can be also Mm, these two extremes can be put together some somehow yeah. because also a one to one session yeah, a modern the modern technology gives us also the possibility to give out the one to one session so from the very private we have the possibility nowadays to complement it with a very open uh, uh, approach uh, and what I'm trying to find out is, is a way eventually to complement these two, two approaches but okay this was a concluding remark that I wanted to make and <laughs> thank you very much to all of you it was as usual very very enriching uh, exchange of of ideas and feelings and energy of course also so i'm going to now bye
I, I, I can't even convey how much I appreciate everyone's contribution and everyone's voice in this. It's uh, it's really what's going on here is lovely. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a privacy, like I'm pretty open. Also, I think the only times I've asked you to stop recording is when it involves uh, talking about someone else to invite or uh, announcing something that shouldn't be announced publicly, like an event or something like that, to which you all are still invited, if you remember what I'm, what I'm referring to um, in California, if you're able to make it, um, it would be lovely to have anyone come that uh that feels drawn to it uh so i I do want to share on the privacy line for um for the first a number of people over the years have asked me to record myself reading sabatry and i've always just kind of said no and finally in germany this dear sweet grandmotherly german amazing human being asked me and i said yes and and i was going to do it um Oh, uh, and post it at collaboration.org, but I'm happy to consider also posting it at, um, at Infinite Conversations. It really doesn't matter to me, uh, either one where it's posted. And, and wow, I look forward to exploring this with you. I'm, uh, one thing to, to John, Debashish did, I don't know where they are available, but at the Sri Aurobindo Ashram in Lodi, he, did give a four-part talk on the seven quartets of becoming. I, I can, if you can't find it, I'll poke around. Just let send me a note or something and, and uh, let me know. Um, they're, they're lovely. They're nice. For me, I don't know if I would approach that book with this group only because um, – I love that book for its mapping. I don't, I'm not necessarily looking for all the cross-referencing with, uh, uh, the, the book is lovely. I've had one pass through it. The maps for the, the seven quartets of becoming are is the 28 limbed path of yoga that he got from Vivekananda while in prison in etheric body form. And uh, the maps that Debashish has in that book are excellent, but then they're also almost, uh, sh- uh, for me, it's it's like missing the component of it. I always wanted to get to Sri Aurobindo's record of yoga, which it's, it's sort of like a helpful step in that direction. But for me, it's like, I need the, I need the direct contact. So, so that's that's all. I, I I may consider having another pass through seven quartets of becoming, but I'm not really too interested in discussing it in the not, at least not in the way that we did the life divine. Again, I'm I'm open to consider uh, other ways and other approaches. Yeah, I don't know if we're deciding anything from here. I am concerned though that it, I know you all probably have to go. The one thing I'm concerned about is that. My presence with this group will be, I'm so biased toward uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mothers, the works that they've left us and the yoga that they're calling us to practice. I'm so biased toward that, that um, my, I wouldn't want my presence on this forum to, th- there's so much, there, there's voice, there's people that I'm thinking of that aren't here that I know want to read and look at other things. So I, I want to kind of uh, uh, remove my preferences from whatever happens next, if that makes sense. And, uh, and I'm really, uh, I, I really want to continue friendship and working with you all in whatever form going forward. Uh, you all have really touched, touched my life in the last six months in doing this work with you. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. We'll, we'll follow up and we'll follow up all individually. And uh, I think something will come together uh, and we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm glad that we had this call and thank, thanks for everything. And, and and I wouldn't worry, Mateo. I'm, you know, you're, I, don't, I, I don't think you will. I don't, I don't think I think it's a positive disruption. I, mean, I think part of what we are if we're a community is we're a community of people that have particular obsessions 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think that's okay. I, I like mm. that you're a, a nerd, a, a mm. open, you know, geek or whatever you want to call yourself. Um, and I like that, you know, that others have other particular particularities, but that there, dialogue and commerce and, mm. um, and exchange and, and mutuality between mm. us all. I think that's, that's really essential. Um, but the, if we couldn't do that, that would, I think, not speak very well about our obsessions. But if we can't... We, we wouldn't be numbering the paragraphs if it wasn't for you. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> and there's no such thing as an unbiased intelligence. Yeah. Even, even AI has biases. You know, it's supposed to be neutral, but it's not. So I think, you know, we just have to live with this. You know, mm. that we're going to have biases. But that we know our biases is a great benefit to everybody so i those kind of biases bring them on <laughs> i think that's great <laughs> that you love too i've been shy about it <laughs> believe it or not i have <laughs> no, it's a love affair it really is and i, I and that happens you know Thank you all. Uh, Octavia Butler talks about a positive obsession and the, the benefits of having a strong, a good positive obsession. I, I mm -hmm. think that probably on your better days, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all of us. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you. I do have to thank run now. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great fast. Thank good you. luck Thanks. on the weekend. Thank mm -hmm. you. Bye-bye. See Bye. you next time.